Hello, and welcome to another edition of Women in Film's Laptop Cinema Club. This is the series that brings you compelling conversations and fascinating stories from the talented women working on the media you love. I'm Ebony Adams, Manager of Public Programs at WIF. We are especially excited today to bring back writer, producer, director, and showrunner Elena Smith to talk about the incredible Dickinson, available on Apple Plus, in which budding writer Emily Dickinson uses her outsider's perspective to explore the constraints of society, gender, and family in the 19th century. This conversation is part of WIF's 2021 special Emmy programming, and we hope that you'll check out all of the great conversations we've got available to you on our YouTube channel. And we especially encourage you to sign up to enjoy our full day of programming that's happening during our inaugural WIF TV Summit on June 23rd. As we head into the 2021 TV award season, we want you to know about the women creatives changing our media landscape. And if you're an Academy voter, when you're reviewing your ballot, we encourage you to vote for women. Joining Elena to discuss Dickinson is Lorena Lee from the LA Times. Thank you both for joining us. And Lorraine, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you. And I am always happy to talk about Dickinson. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, I have to, let's just, can we just jump into Split the Lark and this opera house, can you just talk about how you recreated a 19th century opera house? It is such a phenomenal episode. I think I've watched it like three times just to be in that opera house. Yeah. It's a it's a very, very special place to be, I agree. And um, the whole experience of finding the location and transforming it into the opera house was so spectacular. Um, we the location is um, a historic Lowe's like movie and vaudeville theater that's in Jersey city in New Jersey. And, um, in, in, in like I down in the basement, you can like, or like there's all these different floors and you can crawl through and, and see like, this is a room where Judy Garland performed. And this is where like Bing Crosby, what like, it's a, it's a play, but the main event of it is this movie theater. That's about 50 times bigger than any movie theater I've ever seen. There's just like, I mean, I think there's gotta be over a thousand seats in the main space. And we actually were only using the lobby. Um, the, that, that room, that opulent over the top room with boxes and columns and chandeliers is actually just the lobby of this movie theater. Um, and uh, the movie theater, like the whole building is a, is a historic site, but it's, kind of fallen into disrepair and and they're trying to renovate it um but so we were able to go in to the to this lobby space and turn it into this like imagined recreation of like a jewel box opera house from the 19th century, um, which was our production designer, Neil Patel, um, at the helm of that kind of, um, and Neil has designed a lot of theater and opera. So he was super familiar with like what that experience would be like. And we basically built a stage within this lobby and um, created the opera set that's on the stage. Um, and created these boxes. I mean, one thing that was like interesting to learn, well, obviously there's no electricity in the 19th century. So we were kind of recreating the feeling of like gas lighting. And then also um, there weren't like rows of seats. Everyone sat in individual chairs. So that was also kind of interesting. Um, and, but, you know, I always, I always felt like the episode was really defined by like, red curtains and a certain level of opulence and also like like seeing and being seen and, and also the difference between the public part of the opera house and like the backstage. Because it also reflects this struggle that Emily's having at this point or through this whole season really of, I want this notoriety, but I'm really afraid that this notoriety is going to crush who I am creatively, she is a eccentric being and exposing yourself to that light can often kill that creativity. So, Absolutely. right. And when she has that conversation, even with the, with the opera singer, all of that really kind of plays out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that theme of, I suppose, like a young woman's ambivalence towards fame and being seen um, is both something that's completely taken from Dickinson herself and the kinds of um, 
comments that she made about fame and publicity uh, being extremely dangerous to the artistic soul, as well as obviously the fact that, you know, she didn't really pursue publication in any sort of traditional sense. Some of her, a, a handful of her poems were published while she lived, but it's not really clear whether that was with her consent or not. 2,000 poems that she wrote were only discovered after she died. So this was obviously a woman who shied away from the spotlight, but while at the same time, um, in all these interesting uh, kind of eccentric and mysterious ways, like planned for her own legacy. Um, so she, I believe that she did ultimately want to be understood and to be appreciated as an artist, um, but she had a kind of weird roundabout way of getting there. And I think that one of the questions that, you know, the show is always asking is, is why, what made this brilliant woman so committed to her art and yet at the same time um, retreating from society? And like season two kind of presents one potential answer to that question, which is that it was because when she did try to pursue fame, she felt that it um, cut her off from her own artistic truth. But, you know, all of that comes from, from Dickinson's biography and her own letters and poems, but it's also such a relevant theme for all of us today who, you know, all of us, it doesn't matter if you're a celebrity or if you're just, you know, like a mom at home. I mean, you're, you, you have the option of going online and putting yourself out there and building a brand and cultivating followers and, you know, and even, even outside of the internet and all of that, there's just a fundamental human divide between what is public and what is private. Mm -hmm. And I think that Dickinson is one of our great uh, thinkers on that subject. Like she really values privacy and privacy is something that we are maybe losing entirely in our society. And um, I think Dickinson would certainly give us a warning about that and say, that's don't don't let it go. You you actually need privacy to be human. Well, that is what is also so great about the show is that you're able to talk about or, you know, tackle things that are topical, mm. but keeping them within the era without it feeling like hey, look, these are things we're dealing with right now. You know, whether you're talking about what we're looking at with privacy, whether you're talking about what's happening with the media, because, you know, you have this character, Samuel Bowles, right? He's a publisher. What does he say? Something like move fast and break things, like the Facebook saying, right? And he's almost like the cynical side of modernity. He's, you know, pushing things forward. You have, you know, issues with uh, the civil wars going, you know, race, all these things that we're dealing with right now are bubbling here and you're tackling them in so many different ways. Mm. How do you do that while keeping within the frame, the time frame, and within that story? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one kind of general answer to that is that, you know, things don't change as much as we think we do they do. And so every single fault line in our society that is active right now was certainly active in some way in Dickinson's time. Um, but I also think that the reason why it works the way it does is because the show's method is to be representing the present by means of the past, as opposed to we are trying to represent the past. Mm -hmm. I'm really not trying to represent the past. I, I, I think that, you know, if I wanted to make a show that really showed what life was like in the 19th century, it would, it would be kind of like watching a show in a different language. Um, it would be halting and slow and difficult to understand because, because the cultural context was completely different, obviously, in the 19th century. I mean, for one thing, we don't even get into like the fact that, you know, Emily, her family, and most of the surrounding people in New England at that time were, you know, they were fundamentalist Christians. They were extremely conservative. They were extremely um tied to God and the Bible. And, you know, um, that's, 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 I'm not trying to say that that wasn't true. I'm just, that's yeah. not as useful for me, for example, as some of the other, um, like things like for, you know, her incredible attachment to her nuclear family. 
that's something that feels like for me, extremely personal, relatable, and I can get inside of, you know, my own family or fa- other families that I've known by looking at the Dickinsons and their dynamics with each other. But again, the point here is that we're using the past, we're using this detailed research about a, a, an artist who lived in another time to bring about a sense of truth and insight into our own time. And like, that's my priority here. It's, it's, um, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not writing a history report, but, it, but again, that doesn't mean that what you're seeing in Dickinson isn't true. Like it's all based in fact, but that's just not to me, that's not what the interesting part is. Like the interesting part for me is, is the characters and the stories and, um, and the things that they're wrestling with, like it's, it's, um, you know, Emily, Emily Dickinson is a real person. Emily Dickinson in our show is a character that is created out of my research into Emily Dickinson, my own personal story. And then, you know, Haley's incredible performance and the way that those things come together into like an act of imagination. Um, and I, I have to think that, you know, a poet would approve of an act of imagination, you know, so. Yeah, and I, you know, the way imagination is such a huge part about this and these kind of supernatural flourishes, whether you're talking about death with Wiz Khalifa or, you know, um, the anonymous nobody or the seance scene or whatever it is, um, that imagination. And also when we're talking about like, the vernacular, they're using modern vernacular and the music you put in there, that kind of pulls you out of it into this sometimes supernatural realm and sometimes imaginative. So thank God it's not a history lesson, but there is history there, you know, it makes it playful. It there's, there's, it also, there's also literary history because um, the reason why we can go into the supernatural or a ghost story um, or the presence of death is that those are literary tropes from 19th century novels. And in many ways, I have taken Emily Dickinson's life and said, this is a Gothic tale. This is a tale of a woman who ended up trapped in an attic. You know, um, that's a classic 19th century trope. And I think I think actually people sort of sometimes forget that, like, no, we didn't base this on a book. Like, there is no novel. This isn't like an adaptation of a novel. But it feels that way sometimes because Emily and her family are so rich and juicy and filled with like, you know, the types of dynamics that you would find in a great 19th century novel. Um, you know, the pressure to get married and the, um, the being haunted by death and, um, and, you know, having this, these, these sort of like, um, this brother Austin, who is kind of a failure in some ways, but still completely attached to his sister, who's the actual genius, but isn't allowed to express herself because her father doesn't approve of it. And, and Dickinson obsessives, of which, you know, there are many, they, they know just how endlessly fascinating these people were. And in fact, there's so much drama that like, we haven't even had the opportunity in the show to really unpack. Um, be, there, I don't know what it is about Dickinson, but like all the details surrounding her are they that you just get like you just get obsessed with them. And they're they they I don't know why they're so interesting. It's like they're put together in this paradoxical like crystal of a person. Do you think it's because so little is known about her that there's this obsessed? Is that part of it? Is it part of like the mystery of it that stuff is known about her, but what is known is so full of paradox? Like how did she write so much without showing it to anybody? And how did she have such confidence in her own voice that she broke every rule of like meter and rhyme, but, um, but you know, seems to have been this woman who mostly gardened and baked and cooked and stayed at home you know where like is she a is she a good girl or a bad girl is she like there there's um she I mean what you know her relationship with Sue like 
what was that? How do we even define that? You know, um, when somebody has a sister-in-law that lives next door to them and they write them letters that are unbelievably passionate, you know, love letters and poems. Um, but also sometimes it seems like Emily and Sue didn't even really get along. I think what it is, is that the dramas of her life managed to be sort of enormous and minuscule at the same time. And all of this to me is why she is such a fitting subject for a TV show where, you know, for all the trips and fantasies that we go on in the show, like you're basically in one house with one family. Yeah. And that's why I found it really interesting that with Split the Lark, you bring it into an opera house all of a sudden. And it's like, mm -hmm. you've been in this house for really mostly for two seasons, except for the spa, you know, which was fantastic. <laughs> but in the opera house, you know, why bring it into the opera house? You know, why do that? Well, for one thing, um, you know, yeah, it's true. Emily like rarely took trips away from home. Um, but one, one thing that we know she did is uh, she went to Boston and she saw a famous singer, Jenny Lind sing and um she reflected on the meaning of lynn's fame at the time because she was extremely famous and and was like basically on a tour and would be followed around by groupies and they called it lindomania and um and emily wrote about how um people it, it was kind of that thing of like that people showed up to see the celebrity and not to hear the voice um and modern, right? I mean, not modern, but like, please, that is right now, right? And and I mean, a lot of a lot of you know, scholars have written on how our modern ideas of celebrity culture were actually being created in the 19th century out of the type of daily incessant print media that was being created by people like Sam Bowles, who was really on the forefront of that. Um, and so, you know, this idea that like the pace of media accelerates. And with that comes this new form of like consumption of celebrities that's incredibly um, familiar to us and basically defines our culture today. Although I, I also have had some really interesting conversations and I think Dickinson season two is, is part of these conversations around, you know, is it possible that we're sort of at the end of celebrity and fame? Mm -hmm. um, because, um, in some ways, like everyone now is famous because we all have so much access to the media. Emily is wrestling with all of that and the impact on it for her, but she's she's stepping out of her comfort zone. Her comfort zone is her house and her family. She is now, um, you know, sort of launching out into this bigger world. And the issue is that in this wider world, she's, um, struggling with a lot of blind spots that don't really let her know what people's true agendas and motives are. Um, and I was really inspired by, there's a number of, of different movies that have scenes at operas. Um, I looked at, I mean, two of my favorite movies, actually three of my favorite movies are Age of Innocence, Talented Mr. Ripley and Mulholland Drive. Wow. And all of those have like iconic scenes at opera houses. And um, this idea that like you're sitting in the box watching the show, but you kind of are the show and like the box is the stage and that there's all these different like angles and viewpoints um, of, of people regarding each other. And of course, like the meta aspect of the show itself and that, you know, we designed the, the set of um, La Traviata, which they go see as to look like Sue and Austin's parlors and, and, the, and Adelaide, who's the opera star is wearing a gold dress that's just like Sue's. And so as soon as all three of Emily, Sue and Austin see this, they recognize themselves in the show and feel called out in different ways for their own um, superficiality because Sue is really the one who has, um, you know, started developing a public persona of celebrity to such an extent that she's really in danger of losing her true self. And Emily is much more innocent in certain ways than Sue. Um, but is really struggling to like keep up with her friend and trying to figure out not not keep up in a social sense but literally just keep up with like 
what is changing about Sue, like who, you know, the sort of like um, metamorphosis of Sue in season two is, is very um, scary for Emily, obviously, because Sue has been the source of all of Emily's love and inspiration and insight and uh, really her kind of like true north. So now it's like that Sue is seems to be hiding in the shadows and this other Sue is out in the spotlight and Emily is very disoriented and that's part of what makes her sort of fall into the arms of Sam. Just backing up a little, can you talk a little bit about like pitching Dickinson? Because what from if you just look at the idea of it, it could be a grand mess, really. I mean, it's like, it's a comedy, but it's not really a comedy and it's about, you know, Emily Dickinson in her twenties. I mean, how, what were there? What were the reactions in the room? Was it like, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, or what was it? Well, I, I think the, 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 those were the reactions until I actually wrote the pilot, and I didn't sell the show until I had written the pilot. And so, when you had the pilot written, it. I mean, you know, and I've never, I've never sold a show that was off of a pitch. I, I, I hear that that happens, but I've never, I, to me, I think probably because I am originally a playwright, like I would, it, it's, it's, it would be a little bizarre to me to, to start with a pitch. Like I sort of always feel like I'm starting, need to start with a script because like the script is the first proof of concept of the thing. Right. And like, so I wrote a pilot that said, you know, this, Taylor Swift song drops while Emily Dickinson is walking through the woods in the 19th century and, um, you know, and had the, the, the kind of like interplay of contemporary slang with 19th century um, sound, in, like, you know, the, the sort of more period vernacular or something like that. Um, you know, there's about 8 million needles to thread in Dickinson all the time and we thread them on every level of production from the script to the performances, to the design, to the musical choices and the editing. And it's always this balance of like elegance and attitude. Um, but I suppose there's a basic principle, which is like the characters are grounded in their world and circumstances. And we never want to bump the audience out of that the audience should always remain completely invested in what is happening to Emily because of course it's Emily's problems and constraints that are the stakes of the show. And so if those don't feel real, then the show isn't about anything. The world of Dickinson has its own internally consistent rules. All of our design is completely period accurate. And, and we, we, we don't even use things that were in, invented in 1870. We have, you know, it's like, if I, if I write in a script, like uh, this happened the other day, like I, I wrote that they, somebody was having an ice cream cone and my um, props person said ice cream cones didn't exist in, in 1862. And I'm like, okay, what did exist? And we found out that there was like this early form of ice cream that you could get in a glass dish and like walk around and eat with wooden spoons. So I'm like, okay, I guess it's going to be glass dishes. <laughs> Like, and I, but, but being that strict about it is one of the ways that we can allow the audience to feel um, safe in, in, in a world. Yeah. There's the world has consistent rules and the people within that world are pushing against it. So you wrote on the newsroom and you were writing and producing on um, the affair. The world of television has changed a lot, even in that time period a huge amount of fragmentation. And it has opened up just a ton of cracks. I think the model is just broken down in really great and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's opened up a lot of space, right? And we're seeing all these different voices come in. And I think Dickinson's part of that. Absolutely. Do you think you're seeing narratives, particularly from women now, that are really changing the trajectory of what we're seeing on television? Yeah, without question. And I mean, I think we were before Dickinson too. And I think that there are shows that came before Dickinson that paved the way for Dickinson. And I think about like girls and transparent and, um, uh, and like Atlanta and, um, you know, I could, I'm sure I could name others that, that like 
were really breaking the mold and letting people be at the center of the di- of the dialogue that hadn't been before and doing challenging storytelling, you know? Um, and I think that television, I mean, one way to look at it is maybe just that like television as a literary form probably started coming into its own around the time of like the Sopranos and the wire and, um, more and more experimentation is opened up and made possible as there are more and more shows. Um, The trade-off is that, you know, it's harder and harder to sort of assemble a large enough cohort of people who have seen the show and uh, know it that, that, that you, you know, to know, to really, to really be, and, and also, I mean, frankly, also the fact that, you know, as creators, we are not really uh, given any real data about our shows, um, which I actually think will be probably like a forefront of, of, you know, action and dispute over the next like decade, because at this point, there's no real way to evaluate the value of what you've created outside of that data. So it's going to become really essential for creators to be able to get it. And not just creators, but everyone who invests in a show. I think, I think that's pretty obvious, you know? Um, But, you know, we are now all just online sort of competing for eyeballs and for pieces of like, um, uh, you know, the only limited resource at this point is people's attention. Right. And um, there seems to be absolutely no limit to the amount of money that that, you know, these giant corporations will put into the creation of entertainment. But when you have, you know, this sort of unbelievable like surfeit of content, um, you know, how do you how do, what what is, what even is the definition of success? You know, I think it's very interesting question and very different from what it was. Certainly 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's tricky and it's not just happening in TV. It's happening everywhere because this is what the internet does to the media landscape. You know, it is a democratizing force, but it's also sort of a flattening force. And it just kind of, um, means that we're all on a level playing field in some way, which is great which is really great because there can be maybe perhaps like fewer abuses of power. Um, But it means that things are very fragmented and everybody's not having the same conversation. And I mean, I, I don't know, to be perfectly honest, like I still feel like people haven't really seen my show, you know? Um, I, I know some people have, I mean, and also COVID has sort of made this even more exaggerated because like, I haven't really seen that many people outside of the people who work on my show you know? Um, and so it's very, it's very hard to assess what it, what it means right now to be making a television show. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting to hear that from you because I was listening to the creators of Blackish and some of the cast the other night and they were saying exactly the same thing. And here's a network show that's been on for years and years, really successful, same thing, really hard to gauge. And is it niche audiences? Is it not? I mean, so another uh, thing that's pretty fascinating is that the audience is no longer. We, I grew up in the eighties and nineties thinking of, you know, Thursday nights demographics, you know, no, there, there, there's every audience now is completely global and completely, um, uh, you, ubiquitous in, in terms of time. It's it, anyone could watch your show at any minute, anywhere in the world. It, at re, you know, anyone could be discovering Dickinson right now for the first time anywhere from their, from whatever, like once they just access Apple TV, you know, and that changes things too. And maybe it means that, you know, um, yeah, like there's, there's, there's just, there's just so much more to consider. It's not about like 18 to 49 year olds in, you know, the 50 states. Or whatever. <laughs> so um, you had said earlier that there is so much about Emily Dickinson still to unpack, right? And a lot of times with, you know, other series, you, you get through one season, you're like, wow, how are they going to stretch this out? Dickinson, it's the other way around. It's like, oh my God, like how many seasons can we get? You know, like 
you can keep unpacking her and unpacking her. And so you, did you just wrap up season three? Yeah. Can you talk about what that was like or what can you talk about? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I am, we just wrapped season three. I'm so excited for it to, you know, um, see the light of day. I genuinely think it is our best season yet and our most epic season. Um, it's wild. I can't wait for people to see it. Um, uh, but I really, I don't know, I don't really know uh, yet about the future of the show. Um, be, you know, I kind of feel like, again, in this landscape, things happen very differently than they used to. There's no like real rolling schedule to anything. And um, there's there's a lot of pieces that have to fall into place in order to make a season of Dickinson, you know? Um, so, so whether, whether or not those, those pieces fall into place is not even something I'm trying to think about right now because I'm so tired and am <laughs> coming out of a, coming out of a global pandemic and having yeah. actually managed to make season three in COVID, which is like a complete triumph. And we, we literally wrapped last night and I have to admit that I took my mask on the last take and like threw it in the trash because I was just like I'm not wearing this anymore <laughs> um it was so hard making a tv show in COVID it was so hard so I mean there's there's stuff that just sort of needs to be I think processed and released and like um I'm just I'm really excited to like celebrate season three with everybody because um like I said it's it's we've, we've really swung for the fences this time. And I mean, we have on every season, but I don't know, our, our, our team, you know, was at the wrap party last night being like, I can't believe we made it. So it was really. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember um, speaking to um, one of our previous conversations with the cast about shooting during COVID, not only with the masks on, but they're wearing all these layers of clothing. They're like beneath the, and Haley was like, I, or it was Jane, I was going to suffocate beneath all these layers of clothing and a mask. I'm like, you are a hero. Oh, I know, and we also, we also had never, we had always shot in winter before and we shot in like, we started in, you know, March and went into June. So it also got hot. And, you know, these poor actors are wearing like 15 petticoats and corsets and period dresses and masks and like, oh, oh what women have had to you suffer. They look, they look damn good in those corsets. So. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you so much. It's always good talking to you. And I'm so good talking to you, Lorraine. Thank you. Thanks.